All right, good to see everybody. Can I uh, have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 12? Yes, if you know this, we are in the book of Exodus, so we are continuing our study after uh, not having met for three weeks, our third week since we've uh, last been in Exodus, and um, maybe it's a good time to just review a little bit before we uh, actually get into tonight's study. But uh, by the time we get to chapter 11, God has brought nine of the ten plagues upon the Egyptians. He is preparing to bring upon them the tenth and the most devastating plague of all, the, the uh, death of the firstborn. But before he does that, he has his people plunder, quote unquote, the Egyptians by asking them for articles of gold, silver, bronze, precious uh, jewels, uh, expensive clothing. As we've already seen, these valuables that the Egyptians willingly gave, right, just to get these folks out of here, whatever you want, take whatever you want, whatever you want, here it is, take uh, it. It amounted to back pay, really. All the years of slavery uh, that the children of Israel put into the Egyptian economy, received nothing out of it, so now they are getting back pay. But as we're going to see, a lot of these, these things are going to be used in the building of the tabernacle, which is going to require gold, silver, bronze, precious stones, uh, fine uh, cloth, and so on and so forth. So we'll see that as we go. But uh, as they're plundering now the Egyptians, this was something that God promised uh, 400 and some odd years earlier to Abraham, how that at one point his descendants would go into Egypt where they would be uh, slaves for 400 years. And God would then bring them out with a mighty hand and with great riches. You can read about that in Genesis 15, verse 14. This then brings us to chapter 12, which begins with God saying to his people in verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. As we said last time, this is going to be the beginning of a new life for the Jewish people. Therefore, this would become the first month for them signifying a new beginning. It would also become the beginning of another calendar for them, because now the Jewish people would have two calendars that would govern their lives, one civil and the other religious. And so here God takes the seventh month of their, uh, of their civil calendar year and makes it the first month of their ecclesiastical year. Uh, for the Jewish people, their civil calendar begins... Uh, somewhere around our late September, early October, depending on how it falls. Uh, their ecclesiastical calendar begins in the spring, our late April, or our, excuse me, our late March or early April. But the very first feast of their religious year is the Passover. Now, as we all know, in reality, there was only really one Passover that took place 3,500 years ago in Egypt. All the others have been memorial feasts commemorating this one and only Passover. If we could sum up the word Passover, uh, we could, excuse me, if we could sum up the Feast of Passover in one word, it would be the word redemption. Redemption. It is the Feast of Redemption, celebrating and commemorating how God delivered his people from the bondage of Egypt through the blood of the Lamb. Of course, as we said last time, the Passover pointed to Jesus who not only kept the feast, guess what? He fulfilled the feast. Because in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul referred to, Jesus, referred to Jesus as our Passover who was sacrificed for us. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Let's still give a running start on today's study. We, uh, we got as far as verse 9 last time, but let's back up to verse 3. And uh, let's just read together. Um, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let, it, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of, of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall uh, make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, 
with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what, sh uh, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, <clears throat> and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So, once again, we need to understand that the thing that would cause the judgment of God to pass over each house, sparing the firstborn inside, well, wasn't that the house contained good people, all right? It was that the blood of the lamb was applied to the doorpost and lentil of the house by faith. I mean, the house could have had the worst sinners in the world living there. But as long as the blood of the lamb was applied to that house by faith, the judgment of God passed over that house, just like today. God doesn't save good people. He saves sinners who repent, obviously, and give their hearts to Christ, applying His blood not to their houses, but to their hearts by faith. And it uh, doesn't matter how terribly you live, how much sin you've been involved in, uh, God will save any who come to Jesus and receive Him as Lord and Savior again by faith, applying His blood to their lives. Also, God commanded, though, during the fa uh, Passover meal, that uh, his people were to eat the Passover lamb with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. We talked about this last time. Uh, the tasting of the bitter herbs during the Passover meal would always remind the Jews of their years of bitter slavery down in Egypt. That was obvious, right? And then even today, they will take the bitter herbs and dip them into salt water, which the salt water reminds them of the tears that were shed all those years of uh, slavery their forefathers uh, shed as they were slaves in Egypt. Um, also the Lord says that they were to eat the lamb with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. Uh, and he says that for two reasons. One practical, one spiritual. Practically speaking, they were to eat unleavened bread because it spoke of having to leave quickly. Okay, That first Passover they had to eat uh, standing up with their sandals on, staffs in their hand. After that, every Passover since, of course, they reclined the table because that was just commemorating. But on that night, the first Passover, the real Passover, they had to leave quickly, all right, which meant they wouldn't have time to let their bread rise or leaven. We see this in verse 39, where it says, And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because... They were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. So a practical reason, first of all, they had to eat unleavened bread. They had to leave town quickly, all right? But also there was a spiritual reason in the Lord having them eat unleavened bread with the Passover lamb after, of course, it was killed, and the blood was applied to the doorpost and lintel of their house, very important to order now. After the blood was applied, then they were to eat the Passover lamb, which had been roasted, uh, with unleavened bread. And there was a spiritual reason for that. In fact, it was such an important reason that uh, God actually instituted another feast to follow the Passover that would really memorialize this principle. Uh, he called it the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Read, uh, starting with verse 14. So God says, this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation. So... It started with a Sabbath, and it ended with a Sabbath, a holy convocation. No manner of work shall be done on them. 
and that which everyone must eat that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, the same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. And so, of course, the Passover, and, and you have to understand, this second feast follows immediately after Passover. Passover fell on the 14th of Nisan, and then at sundown, of course, they were on a, on a uh, lunar calendar, so at sundown, it was now the 15th of Nisan, which started the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a feast that ran for seven consecutive days. Now, to understand the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you have to understand what leaven is. All right? What leaven is. Very simply, leaven is dough. Leaven is dough that yeast has permeated through, resulting in fermentation and causing the dough to rise. What they would do is they would keep a starter piece uh, of leaven. Uh, every time they had made a batch of dough and they, uh, and they mixed in a starter piece of leaven, uh, that would be in the evening now for the next day's bread, okay? So in the evening, the women would take the flour and make dough. And then they would always have a little piece of the previous day's uh, uh, dough that had been leavened, and they would mix it in with the dough and let it sit all night. And by the morning time, the leaven had permeated through the entire new lump of dough, and uh, they would use that to bake with for that day, but not until they removed a small starter piece for the next day's bread. Now look. We know that in Scripture, leaven is always a type of sin or evil because it spreads like sin. It corrupts like sin. Fermentation is a form of digestion. And like sin, it sin it eats us away, basically. So leaven is like sin, and it spreads like sin, it corrupts like sin, and it puffs up like sin. But Paul picked up on this, and he said a little leaven, we all know, in those days they did, uh, will permeate through the entire lump of dough. He said, just like a little sin, if not dealt with, will spread through a life or a church until everything is corrupted. Now, I'm not sure if they understand the spiritual significance. I think they did. When God talked about them celebrating uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know, eating no leaven, uh, they probably understood what he was getting at. That leaven was a type of sin, therefore, to eat unleavened bread or to have a feast called unleavened bread, well, it spoke of holiness and purity. Holiness and purity. This principle was so important that God said that any Jew that ate leaven during the seven day feast would be cut off from Israel. They would be put outside the covenant of God's people. They would be ostracized. They would become a stranger to the covenant of God. That's how seriously God took this feast. Now, what is the significance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread to us as Christians? Well, very simply, if Passover speaks of redemption, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread speaks of sanctification. The word sanctification literally means to be set apart to God as His own special people, His covenant people. It's the same Hebrew word, excuse me, it's the same Hebrew root that the word holy comes from. The children of Israel, now as we're studying the story, the children of Israel were enslaved down in Egypt. And through the blood of the Passover lamb, God brought them out and brought them through the Red Sea, which Paul later on would say was a type of water baptism. And the first thing God did was he led them to Mount Sinai. And he said to them that, here's what he said, when he brought them out of Egypt, led them to Mount Sinai, he said, now, be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. In other words, you have, you know, how you lived your life when you were slaves in Egypt was one thing. But now I've redeemed you out of that system. You belong to me now. You're my covenant people. And therefore, as such, I want you to live a new kind of life. What kind of life? An unleavened life. An unleavened life. 
Look, once a person has been redeemed by the blood of the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ, God says to all of us who are his people, look, how you live when you were slaves of Satan, living in his kingdom, the world, is one thing. But now you belong to me. I have delivered you out of that system through the blood of my son, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And therefore, you are to live for me now. You are to live a new kind of a life. You are to live a holy life, an unleavened life is the idea. God says to us the same thing he says to Israel. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Look, we've said it before, let me say it again. It's okay for a ship to be in the sea, but watch out when the sea gets into the ship. It's okay for a Christian to be in the world, but watch out when the world gets into the Christian. Look, we're about to see the children of Israel delivered out of Egypt, right? The real work would be in God delivering Egypt out of them. As they constantly want to go back to the leeks and the onions and the garlics of Egypt. I mean, to take Israel physically out of Egypt wasn't very hard for the Lord at all. Nothing is hard for him, we understand it. But taking them physically out of Egypt, not, not a problem. To take Egypt out of them, much harder. Much harder. Okay? Um, just like God taking us out of the world as Christians. The moment we got saved, right? The moment we were redeemed. That wasn't hard for God. Getting the world out of us, that takes a much longer time. As somebody once said, salvation is the miracle of a moment. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Paul the Apostle used the feast of Passover and unleavened bread to relate to our redemption and sanctification as the people of God in the New Covenant. Turn to 1 Corinthians 5. Paul is drawing from his Jewish roots. He knows that all seven major feasts uh, point to Christ. First three to his first coming, last three to his last coming, and right in the middle you have the feast of Pentecost, which spoke of the birth of the church. Paul understands this, all right? And so in 1 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 6, he says, Your glory is not good. You know, the Corinthians. Because they had all these spiritual gifts going on, they really felt they were spiritually superior to everyone else. But they were living very carnal lives. And Paul says, look, you're all puffed up with pride about how spiritual you are. Yes, you know, you're, you're, you've got all kinds of sin in your midst you're not dealing with. You've got a guy uh, living with his own stepmother. You're not doing anything about that. He says, your glory is not good. Do you not know? that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Not very flattering uh, language, but we get the idea. Since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, uh, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread, of sincerity and truth. And again, Paul is drawing from these two feasts, right? To this day, in an Orthodox Jewish home, and there's probably other, a lot of other Jewish homes that are not classically Orthodox that still do this, but in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread starting, the women will go through the houses, okay, and they will purge the house of all the leaven, the Twinkies, the cupcakes, everything's got to go. <laughs> But because it was really the man's responsibility to purge the house of leaven, because he was the spiritual leader of the family, she would always leave uh, a handful of breadcrumbs in a conspicuous place with a little feather and a little dustpan next to it. And he would come in, you know, king of the castle, spiritual leader, <laughs> see the breadcrumbs there and take the little feather and the little, you know, pan and, and, uh, and, and brush the, uh, the breadcrumbs into this little, you know, dustpan go outside, throw it in the garbage where it was burned somehow, and he would come back in and pronounce the house now purged of all leaven. They do it because of tradition, not because they really understand the implication. The implication is you've just celebrated Passover. You've just observed Passover, which speaks of redemption, and now you're to live a new kind of life. What kind? Well, as we've already said, a sanctified or unleavened life. And it has to be a completely sanctified or unleavened life. How many days was the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Seven. What is the number seven in the Bible? The number of what? 
completeness. So God is saying, look, this can't be, you know, what you've just celebrated Passover, the Feast of Redemption. Now you have to begin to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it has to be a complete sanctification. There's something else that's very important to understand, as you've already figured out. There was no gap of time between Passover and <coughs> Unleavened Bread, right? I mean, the Passover was on the 14th of Nisan, and starting immediately afterward on the 15th, a seven-day feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which spoke of sanctification. I don't think it's hard for us to figure out what God had in mind when he did this, right? He was communicating to his people back then and to us today that once they were redeemed, okay, once they had observed Passover as a Jew, uh, but we understand that once we are redeemed, we are to begin to live immediately a new kind of a life, a holy life. An unleavened life, right? There's a lot of Christians who think, well, I'll get saved today and down the road sometime. I'll get serious, okay? I want to make sure I go to heaven, but I'm not ready to stop sowing my wild oats to a certain degree. But God is saying, you are completely off in understanding what salvation or redemption really is. It's the beginning of a new life. And that life must start immediately after you're redeemed. Oh, be holy is I am holy, says the Lord. Look, Paul the Apostle was one of the greatest theologians that ever lived. And he wrote the book of Romans, the greatest book of theology, I believe, that it was ever written. If you study the book of Romans carefully, you will find that Romans 1 through 8 are really um, Paul's exposition of these two feasts, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In the first five chapters of Romans, Paul tells us how a person gets saved. It's not through the works of the law, but by applying the blood of Jesus Christ to your life by faith. That's Passover. Then in chapters 6 through 8, he shifts over to then begin to expound about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He starts off uh, chapter uh, 6, verse 1 by saying, So what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live? any longer they're in. And you can study those three past, those three chapters on your own. Basically what he's saying in the first five chapters is you are saved by the blood of the Lamb, not through your works or the law. And once you're saved, how are we to then live? Immediately a holy life. A life of consecration, a life of separation. Of course, all of these feasts point to Jesus. He is our Passover. Okay, the Lamb of God was sacrificed for us. But he's also, uh, with regard to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's symbolic of his body. I mean, uh, the body of our Savior who was sinless, he was without left. I mean, he spoke of himself as the bread of life. Born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. Years ago, we had Zola Levin come out to the church. He's with the Lord now. But he came out to the church, and uh, but uh, he had this to say. Um, not at our church necessarily, but he had this to say when it was writing. Uh, he wrote quite a bit as a Jewish believer. He's commenting on this. He said, the very piece of bread used by the Jews during this week of unleavened bread is a good picture of our Lord. Anyone who has seen the Jewish matzo sees that it is striped, by his stripes we are healed, pierced, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and of course, pure, without any leaven, as his body was without any sin. The Passover ceremony of breaking and burying and then resurrecting a piece of this bread, the middle piece, he says, as the Son, uh, which represents the middle member of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, uh, very obviously presents the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in the midst of the modern Jewish Passover celebration and folk. Of course, as a completed Jew, he understood the significance. Uh, a lot of Jews today, they, they, they observe the Passover, well, I think most Jews, and they have no idea of all the implications, how it all points to their Messiah, when they don't really believe Jesus is their Messiah. But we see it, okay? We get excited about these feasts because they so clearly point to Jesus, don't they? Well, back to Exodus 12, verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, 
and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Notice the word strike. And if you were to take a, a little piece of hyssop bush, dip it in the basin of blood, and strike the doorpost and lintel of your house, it would make a cross on your door. Of course, they had no idea what that meant to them back then. We understand it. Verse 23, For the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and for your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, so this will be now years later when they enter the promised land, that you shall keep this service, this Passover celebration. That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. We have notice verse 26 again. It shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? As I said earlier, there was only one real Passover that took place 3,500 years ago in Egypt. All the others have been memorial feasts commemorating this one and only Passover. So each year, when the Jewish people though observed the Passover, it first of all was to remind the adults of all the hardships their forefathers and foremothers endured all those years, 400 years, while they were slaves down in Egypt. So for the adults, of course, it was a time that reminded, it was a memorial that reminded them of this heritage that their forefathers and mothers gave to them. I mean, because they were the ones in Egypt uh, that paid dearly that they might, their descendants might enter the promised land and prosper. So for the adults, it was a reminder, a memorial. But the Passover was also designed by God to provoke curiosity in the hearts of the children. In fact, to this very day, during the, fast, the Passover uh, meal, at one point, the youngest in the family is supposed to ask this question, why, Father, is this night different from every other night? And of course, at this point, it then gives the father, or if he's dead, the eldest son, the opportunity to recount the whole Passover story. That every generation of young people might have it burned into their hearts so that when they got older, they would pass it down to their children so that God's people never forgot this event. In fact, guys, if you were to pick one event that the whole Old Testament uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, was at the heart of the Old Testament would be the it would be the uh, Exodus, which the Passover was a part, right? Of course, the one event that the whole New Testament revolves around is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which involves our deliverance from the bondage of sin and death. So you have to understand these are this is a very important thing we're studying. Uh, yes, the Passover, but of course we're going to see next time the actual Exodus, but. Um, <coughs> God wanted his people to remember this. How he led them out of Egypt, nothing they could have done on their own could have delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. That is what they were born into. You were a, you know, I mean, as of this point, of course, the Jews for many generations had been born into slavery in Egypt. And there was no hope of ever changing that reality. They were born into it. They were stuck as slaves. They would never... They could never do anything to free themselves from their slavery. It would take a miracle from God. Just like we were born the slaves of sin and Satan. We were born into that bondage. We will, would have lived our entire lives in that slavery without any chance that we could have done anything to deliver ourselves. It took a miracle to deliver us. Salvation is a miracle. A miracle. All right? Well, that then brings us to the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. Verse 28, 
And the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. All the firstborn in Egypt died in God's judgment, which is symbolic. We talked about this last time. Understand, Egypt is a type of the world, right? All the firstborn in Egypt died. Symbolically, what was being communicated to us is that all the firstborn of the human race, in other words, the Bible talks about that uh, uh, when we are born into this world, we are born of Adam, right? Our first birth was that we were born of Adam. And in Adam, all what? All died, right? The only way for us to escape the judgment that's coming upon the firstborn of Adam, which is all the human race, is to somehow change families so that you're no longer a member of the family of Adam, which bears a blood curse, but now you're the family of the, a member of the family of God. The only way, you can't join God's family, you've got to be born into it. That requires a second birth. All right? We were all born once in Adam, we're all destined to die in judgment. To escape that, we have to apply the blood of Christ to our lives. And as we do, we are born again. And that allows us to basically shift families from the family of Adam to the family of God. That's what's being communicated here. And look, only the Jewish people living in the separated area of Goshen were spared. Of course, it's symbolically represents you know, believers in the church separated from the world. We are the ones who will escape the coming judgment. Read Revelation 6 to 19. But uh, those who are in Christ, who are separated from the world, because once we give our hearts to Christ, God takes us out of the world, places us in the body of Christ. We are sanctified now. We are set apart. And as such, we have passed from death to life. We will never come into judgment. And that's what's being communicated here by the Jewish people, believers, Living in Goshen, which was a place that was exempted from the judgment, it speaks of us as Christians being in Christ, separated and exempt from the judgment of God that's coming upon this world. That's what the rapture is. It's God evacuating us out of here before his judgment falls, right? But again, the only reason the Jewish people were spared the judgment of God, the angel of death, was because they had applied the blood of the Passover lamb to the doorposts and lentil of their house by faith. And the idea behind the statement in verse 29, that no one escaped this judgment upon the Egyptians from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the lowliest firstborn criminal in the, in the dungeon was that God, listen, God is no respecter of persons. That's what's being communicated. You see the language there, right? The Holy Spirit made a point to say, look, it didn't matter if you were Pharaoh's firstborn or you were a firstborn criminal living in a dungeon in Egypt. All the firstborn died. Just like all the firstborn of Adam are going to die if they don't repent and receive Christ. Doesn't matter if you're a king. Doesn't matter if you're a prime minister. Doesn't matter how wealthy you are. You could be the wealthiest person on the face of the earth or the lowliest uh, slave somewhere uh, living in some kingdom on the face of the earth. All who are in Adam will die. They will be judged. Only those who are in Christ will be spared. And of course, the only way to escape the coming judgment is to be in Christ. Is to have Christ's blood applied to your heart by faith. All right, well, let's finish up. Verse 31. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, now this is Pharaoh. Okay, now the firstborn have been wiped out, which means Pharaoh's firstborn as well. He was in line for the throne, considered a god. These plagues were all poured out on the gods of the Egyptians. Pharaoh and his firstborn son were looked upon as gods. So here his son dies as well. And Pharaoh now is completely demoralized. No more bravado. No more who is the Lord that I should obey him to let uh, the, Jews, the Jews go. None of that. He is a broken man at this point, at least for a while. At least for a while. 
So he calls for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Look, rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We shall all be dead before the rest of us are struck dead. Get these people out of here. Just let them have whatever they want. Just get them out of here. Verse 34. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the, of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sokoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children, besides women and children is the idea. They didn't really count the gals. 600,000 men plus women and children, probably between two and a half and three million people. Verse 38. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Now this is as far as we're going to get tonight, because I want to key in on one phrase that is very important for us to understand. You notice the statement that beside God's true people that came out of Egypt, they were joined by a mixed multitude that left Egypt also. Who was this group? Okay, what was this group all about? Who did they consist of? Well, for lack of a better term, they were religious unbelievers. Religious unbelievers, non-Jews. That had come to believe that the God of the Jews was a very powerful God, and yet who stopped short of committing their lives to Him and becoming part of His covenant people by being circumcised and so on. All right? I mean, basically, guys, they were thrill seekers. We don't have those in the church today. No. <laughs> they were spiritual thrill seekers. Those that marveled at the power of the God of the Hebrews, I mean, they enjoyed watching Him work miracles over the whole. These uh, plagues were not fun things to watch, but you get my drift. They were, they were enamored. They were enthralled at the power. They'd never seen power like this in all their years of, of worshiping all these Egyptian deities. They had never seen anything like what the God of the Hebrews unleashed in the way of power. And so they were completely uh, taken with the, the, God of, uh, the, God of, uh, me, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews, I should say. Um, they were completely enamored with him. And so, when he left with his people, guess what they left too? They left too. Because after all, he wants to be a part of the losing team anyways, right? I mean, God had just kicked the snot out of the Egyptians. Why stay with the losers? And the God of Israel, he's powerful. He's, uh, wow, I, to watch him work, that's amazing. Very entertaining. So when God left Egypt with his people, guess what? The mixed multitude went with them. Guys, they were the forerunners of so many in the church today. Those that believe in God, believe in his power, and we've been running around looking for him to work miracles. Some, some of these folks are running from one service to another, one church to another, uh, following after signs and wonders, always looking for God to work a miracle. Because they're fat, they're thrill seekers. They're Holy Spirit junkies. Okay? And they run around, you know, they believe in God intellectually. They uh, run around hoping to find God, do a miracle here or there to entertain them. But they've not really given their hearts to Jesus Christ, making him Lord. There's no cross involved. Jesus said, You can't be one of my disciples unless you take up the cross and deny yourself. These folks aren't denying themselves, they're looking to God. Anything, they give them all kinds of material blessings and so on. Guys, the mixed multitude among God's people, Israel, back then, are the same as the lukewarm among God's people in the church today. 
Turn to Revelation chapter 3. I want to end with this tonight. You may see it as a digression. I don't really see it that way. I see it as an important point to make uh, because those who are lukewarm in the church is identified by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those who are lukewarm in the church, I believe, I believe coincide with uh, those that were the mixed multitude back in Moses' day. And I think this is a pretty important territory for us to understand, so we'll end with this tonight. I'm just going to read the whole letter to the Church of Laodicea, Revelation 3, starting with the, with the verse 14. Now this is Jesus Christ dictating to John these uh, letters. This is the last one of seven. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Those are all titles for Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So that because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now, if you really want to get into all of that, go online and, and uh, listen to the study we did on this letter uh, as we did our Revelation study. We went into this in detail. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now the word hot there, okay, in the Greek means boiling hot, and speaks of a genuine Christian who was on fire for God, okay? <coughs> the word cold there in the Greek means icy cold. And it represents the person who doesn't, really, doesn't know God, um, doesn't pretend to know God, or doesn't act religiously at all, okay? I mean, this kind of person is a total pagan. They know they're a pagan. They like being a pagan. They're cold for the things of God. The hot and the cold ones, guys, are easy. It's the lukewarm ones that are somewhat controversial. There's two main views. First of all, the lukewarm Laodiceans represent backslidden Christians that have cooled in their relationship with the Lord and have become carnal and worldly, but are still true Christians. And the second interpretation is the lukewarm Laodiceans represent religious unbelievers who, unlike the cold ones, don't openly reject the gospel, attend church, and claim to know the Lord, but are not genuinely saved. You say, which is the correct interpretation? I've already told you what I believe. I might be wrong, but what I believe is the latter is true, okay? Jesus, don't forget now, the last four letters, okay, uh, are in the present ten, uh, tense, okay, uh, you know, hang in there till I come. So these last four churches, whatever they represent, and I go, again, go online and we talk about this, represent churches that are going to be around in the last days when Jesus returns. I believe, personally, that this final letter, the letter of the Laodiceans, uh, is addressed to the last day's apostate church, the liberal church, a church that is filled with religious unbelievers. <laughs> Folks like the scribes and Pharisees that Jesus talked about who prided themselves on their religious activities, social good deeds, and thought they were right with God. Notice all the works that are mentioned here, all these works that the Laodiceans were putting their trust in uh, that you know, proved they were so wonderful as Christians, all right, uh, and so on. Uh, look at all the good things we look at all the wonderful things we're doing. You know, we're rich, and back in those days, you know, God only, you know, God, you were, if you were in right standing with God, uh, you would be wealthy because God only blesses those that are righteous with wealth. So the very fact that they were wealthy in their minds, 
indicated that they were right with God and probably the most right with God of any other churches. The only problem was, where was Jesus? Outside, knocking to get in. This was not a lukewarm Christian church. This was a religious, unbelieving, liberal church. A church like we see again today. Amen. Jesus talked about the scribes and Pharisees. They thought they were right with God because of all the good things they did and the laws they kept and uh, social programs they were involved in, but they were, in fact, blind to the true spiritual condition before God. Uh, Jesus likened them and those like them to whitewashed tombs. In Matthew 23, whitewashed tombs, they would, of course, whitewash the tombs around the holidays. Passover was one. Because pilgrims would come from all over the known world to Jerusalem to observe these feasts. Some of them had never been to Jerusalem before. If they had come all that way, <coughs> hundreds of miles maybe, and inadvertently stepped on a tomb, they'd be defiled, couldn't keep the feast. So as a courtesy to pilgrims, uh, the locals would whitewash the tomb so that you could see them from a good ways away. And you would know, well, that's a tomb. I need to steer clear of that. All right? Jesus picked up on that and said, this is a perfect uh, illustration and analogy of the Pharisees and scribes. On the outside, they look all white and pure and holy, but inside, just like a whitewashed tomb, they're full of all kinds of defilement. This is the problem with religion. It only surface cleanses a person and gives them the illusion that they're right with God, but in fact, their heart has not been dealt with at all. Uh, they're still full of hypocrisy and evil and so on. So they're like whitewashed tomb. tombs. The Lord des Jesus describes such people. Uh, turn to Luke 6. Jesus Christ was not free of these kind of disciples, these uh, disciples in name only. Jesus had a lot of groupies, if I can put it that way. People that followed him that believed he was Messiah, possibly. Believed that he had great power, no doubt. But had not really given their lives to him. So a lot of people that want to hang around God as long as God's working and moving and blessing but give my life to him so that I have to obey everything he said. No, I'm not into that. And every once in a while, Jesus would thin the ranks of his disciples. One of these times was in Luke 6, verse 46, when he turns to a group of his disciples, would-be disciples, and says to them, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Turn over to Matthew 7. We'll pick it up. I mean, he does go on in Luke 6 to talk about these folks, but I'll have you back up to Matthew 7. Verse 22. First of all, Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do the things which I say? Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me in that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Churchgoers? Orthodox? Yeah, they called him Lord. Saved? No. You can be Orthodox. You can believe all the right things about Christ. Satan does that. Satan believes all everything we believe is evangelicals about Jesus, his divinity, the fact that he's the only way to the Father, died on the cross, rose again the third day from the dead, uh, bodily from the dead, and so on. Everything we believe is Orthodox evangelicals. And his name. In fact, they were there to see it happen. <coughs> but they're not going to happen. You can be orthodox in your understanding of Christ. That's not enough. As we have said many times, many are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance between their heads and their hearts. It's not enough to give mental assent to the facts of the gospel. You have to bring Jesus into your heart and commit your life to him. Where he becomes Lord. He takes over, right? So Jesus said, you know, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawless. I never knew you. Not that I knew you for all. Some people, some Christians believe you can lose your salvation. I don't. I don't believe that. And here's one of those passages where it says, you know, Jesus didn't say, well, I knew you for a while, but you didn't hang in there, and, you know, you lost your salvation. I never knew. 
I never knew. And what was the evidence that these folks never knew Jesus? They practiced what? Lawlessness. They lived lives contrary to God's laws. Now, as Christians, can any one of us at any given time violate a commandment of God here or there? Yeah, sure. I mean, John said, I've been reading some biographies of Christians uh, that lived a couple hundred years ago. And uh, back then, I think it's still around today, there was a, a very popular doctrine known as Christian perfectionism. Take it from 1 John 3, which basically says that anyone who's in Christ no longer sins because God's seed abides in them, therefore they cannot sin. And so a lot of people picked up on that. John Wesley was one, I believe, and began to teach the doctrine of Christian perfectionism. That once you receive Christ, you no longer sin. I'd like to be a fly. Uh, on the wall of some of their houses, uh, you know. I mean, come on. Of course, they didn't really understand what John was really saying because in the Greek, he doesn't say, he who has the seed of God in him or her never sins. It's in the present tense, cannot keep habitually living in sin is the idea. Sure, we all sin. John said, we say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. It's just that once you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit moves in, gives you a new heart, a new life, or a brand new creation. And your life changes, doesn't it? Do we still sin? Of course. Do we, do we now live habitually in sin like we did before we got saved? Absolutely not. And anyone who claims to be a Christian who can live in habitual uh, sin without any remorse, guilt, or, uh, or desire to change in any way, to me, is a religious unbeliever. The very ones that Jesus is talking about in the church of Laodicea. Remember what he says there in verse 19? Um, Those who I love, I chase, and therefore be zealous, and what? Repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. The idea is that repentance opens the door as you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior now. The lukewarm are like the unbelieving Jews whom Paul lamented in Romans 10 too, for I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You know, it really breaks my heart that these churches that are liberal, and they're uh, very wealthy, many of them, packed. They have a zeal for God, which is manifest in their social work. They, they do, uh, uh, do a lot of good social programs to help the hungry and the needy. I commend them for that. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, Paul said, and seeking to establish their own system of righteousness, have not submitted to God's righteousness, which is in Christ by faith. Paul also warned of these in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, when he warned that the day would come in the last days, uh, that those who would come in the last days would have a form of godliness, yet deny the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that liberalism, which appears to have a zeal for God, but does not have true righteousness, these folks are not saved, that kind of spirituality is nauseating to him. I will vomit them out of my mouth. Pretty descriptive language. Look, spiritually speaking, people usually now, usually initially go from cold, unsaved, to lukewarm, developing, developing an interest in the things of God, to hot, saved and on fire, right? Certainly, a Christian who was once on fire for God can backslide to the point where they are now lukewarm but still Christians. But that's not what Jesus is addressing here. He's not using this terminology to talk about backslidden Christians. He's talking about those who are lukewarm in the sense that they are religious unbelievers. Those who stop short of going all the way to salvation and settle into a, listen, comfortable religiosity or churchianity. These are the ones Jesus is addressing here to the letter of the latest scenes. Let me kind of sketch out in general what they look like. A lukewarm person is worldly and doesn't take obedience or holiness or sin seriously. 
Number two, they may read the Bible from time to time, but it's only a religious exercise. They have no intention of allowing it to change their life by obeying what it commands. Number three, they are often, but not always, sporadic in their church attendance. Their prayers consist mainly of before meals and bedtime, if that. And number four, they never evangelize or take seriously the command to be a light in this dark world and are always consumed with worldly possessions rather than heavenly rewards. That's just some of the main points that characterize these folks. Now listen, and we're done. Why would Jesus say to be cold is better to be than better, better than being lukewarm? I mean, we think of lukewarm, well, that's a step up from cold, right? It's not hot, but it's getting there, right? Why did Jesus say to be cold is better than being lukewarm? Well, lukewarm was simply a person who was getting on fire for God, but hadn't come all the way into a full on on fire commitment, then lukewarm would be better than cold. But if you're talking about lukewarm as an unbeliever, which I believe is the case, it's better to be a cold person than a lukewarm person and not know Christ. Why? How? Because a cold person, look, they know they're cold. They know they're not, a, they're not pretending to be Christians. They're not playing church, all right? They're not giving anybody the illusion that they are Christians at all. They're really hardcore sinners. Someone has said, because it's, uh, he says, because these smug, self-righteous hypocrites are more, far more difficult to reach with the gospel than cold-hearted rejectors. Hey, give me a person that's cold. At least I know where they stand, right? At least I know, you know, and they know they're, they're not pretending to be a Christian. Give me a person like that because I can deal with that. I can give them the truth. A person who is lukewarm, who goes to church, reads the Bible once in a while, uh, believes they have a relationship with Jesus, you try to tell them the truth, you try to give them the gospel, what do they say? You lay a trip on me for now. I'm a Christian. I've grown up in the church. I was a Christian longer than you. I was born a Christian. Or whenever somebody says to me, I, I was born a Christian, that, that's a rhythm. Okay. <laughs> You're not born a Christian. I've been a Christian ever since I was a little kid. Well, maybe, but I doubt that. Okay? That, to me, is the language of a religious unbeliever. Who doesn't have a clue? That's a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Okay? It's a lot harder to reach that kind of person with the truth. Why? Because they've inoculated themselves with so much self-righteousness, they are immune to the true righteousness that's in Christ. They've inoculated themselves. And that's just the Holy Spirit trying to convict them because they already believe they have a relationship with Jesus and are saved. Very difficult. Not impossible, but nothing's impossible with God. I'm just saying, as Jesus said to the Pharisees, you traverse land and sea to make one proselyte to Judaism. When, when you do, you make him twice the son of hell as yourself. What does that mean? Well, it's a lot harder when a person has no faith then a cult will say, like the JWs get to hold of that person and indoctrinates him or her in JW theology, where now they're, they're going to hell, but they believe they have the truth and they're going to heaven. Now you've got to back them out of the false system, get them back on a, when they first started with no faith, and then give the truth. That's a lot more difficult. Of course, God can do anything. It's a lot harder, though. Look. Somebody has said lukewarmness is the greatest blasphemy, for it claims to know and love God while living as though he doesn't exist. Now, guys, we're going to see this mixed multitude became a real stumbling block for the true people of God who came out of Egypt in the days and weeks and months to come after the Exodus, because they were the first ones to murmur and complain in the wilderness. We're going to see this, so I'm not going to say any more right now. Just understand, what did Jesus say about the, uh, the parable of the, uh, the tares? How that Satan came at night and sowed tares? Excuse me, an enemy sowed tares in his neighbor's field. And when Jesus was explaining the parable, he said that represents Satan who sown unbelievers 
in the Church of Jesus Christ. Because if you can't beat them, what? Join Against my church, the gates of hell will not prevail. Take the fingers, okay. If I can't beat them, I'll join them. If I can sow into an on fire body of believers, a church that's on fire, right on, if I can sow into their midst religious unbelievers, the mixed multitude, the lukewarm, eventually I will take that church over. And many a, a, an evangelical, orthodox, Bible-believing church has been taken over. It usually starts with the pastor, by the way. Where one good man leaves the pulpit, he dies or retires, and they call another man who's got the degree, you know, doesn't even know the Lord. They don't know he doesn't know the Lord, of course. And so he is a terror himself. And eventually, he just reproduces himself, as pastors tend to do, until the whole church is left. It's full of terrors. And the devil says, well, I can move on to the next church because this church, is, I got this one. Now, Jesus Christ is knocking on the door to get in. Okay? So the mixed multitude are going to be a real problem. Satan says, you think you beat me? All right, all right. You got them out of Egypt, but I have sown into them a mixed multitude. And they're going to be a great stumbling block to your people on the road. We'll see that as we continue next time. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercies, which are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word, your truth, the light to light our way in the darkness of this world. And if we walk in the light of your truth, Lord, we will never stumble in darkness. And Lord, we just pray that you would set our church completely on fire to the point where everybody who is maybe lukewarm in the sense that they're growing and getting closer to you will get set on fire. And those, Lord, who are mixed multitude will flee because they can't take the heat. And Lord, you will strengthen us and you will purify us. And that we, you will use us, Lord, in these last days in a very powerful way for your glory. So thank you, Lord. We ask you to continue to bless these studies in your word. We ask you in Jesus' name.